tap ballet that's about fusing together different styles. It feels very important to be a woman in charge of this show in the dance world run by men. This is a first. I'm just hoping that it all doesn't come crashing down. And it definitely won't because that would be interesting to watch. Welcome to Court Killers, the show about watching the stuff you love, when you want, where you want, however you want. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, man, I'm Brian Brushwood. And more importantly, that was a Netflix original, Ballet Now, nope. which looks... Ooh, uh, Hulu. Not, oh, Hulu. Hulu. It's Hulu original. You just okay. Kleenexed them. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, man, don't, don't, don't be jello. Uh, <laughs> it happens hey, to... Take, take an aspirin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, no. So a Hulu original, but but Hulu. this looks like a documentary about the ballet biz, right? Uh, yeah, it's about a, a prima ballerina, Tiller Peck, uh, who is being the first woman to curate the Music Center's famed Ballet Now program. That's coming nice. to Hulu July 20th. Very cool. Coming to Cord Killers right now is our guest, Nicole Lee from Engadget. Welcome back, Nicole. Woo! Hello, I am back. What it's do you think of ballet? You. I know. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I think the question was, what do you think of ballet? Uh, ballet. Yeah. Uh, I know of it. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad we're nerds among mer nerds here. Like, like ballet is a level of kinesthetic awareness of, 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 of this, uh, this incredible artistic expression of, of, uh, of, of, of sexual um, Darwinian oh. fitness uh, that, that, that is utterly beyond my ken. And like I can't even understand it well enough to appreciate it and watch it, and I mean, maybe this will be the documentary that'll take me along for the ride. My only exposure to ballet was Black Swan, and I don't know if that was a very positive portrayal. That uh, that that was a a, a, a true documentary. Uh, <laughs> she really grew those wings. Yeah, Sarah no, no, Lane. <laughs> as the ballerina. All right, let's uh, move on to our primary target. We got lots of stuff today. Uh, so really, our, our primary target is about us as viewers today. Pro uh, James Mangold, uh, who you probably m most of people in the audience know as the director from Logan, uh, posted on Twitter that fan outrage may drive people away from wanting to be involved with big franchises. And by people, he means other directors, other creative types. He wrote on Twitter, at the point when work, writing and directing big franchises has become the emotionally loaded equivalent of writing a new chapter of the Bible, with the probable danger of being stoned and called a blasphemer, then a lot of bolder minds are going to leave these films to hacks and corporate boards. Now, one of the things he was responding to was Ryan Johnson, who had tagged fellow director Christopher McQuarrie in a tweet recommending folks follow McQuarrie for writing advice. All of a sudden, a bunch of people who don't like Last Jedi flooded McQuarrie's mentions uh, with a bunch of things about how they much they hate Last Jedi, leading McCory to reply to Ryan Johnson, my friend, after five minutes of this, I don't know why you're still on Twitter. I would have loved to make a Star Wars film someday. I'm cured. So, okay. Uh, I, oh, I'm uh, wearing Star Wars. This side of the story. Hey, by the way, is that Star yeah, Wars? Uh, is, is, is that is that a parody of, of the Flash Gordon poster? Is that what that is? I don't know. I bought I bought this at Disneyland, so maybe. Oh man, that would be that'd be pretty wild if they were going for a parody. <laughs> like, okay. uh, she'll save every one of us. <laughs> um. So okay. So this is one side of the story. I think there's another side of the story. We've talked about previously the fact that uh, a bunch of movies, for example, Adam Sandler um, uh, tends to love to make movies in Hawaii. Why? Because it's fun to be in Hawaii and, uh, and, and it's a beautiful place to shoot and it's a pleasant time being there. Uh, meanwhile, you have incredible A-list actors who uh, some might say are, are acting and playing roles beneath their station in a bunch of uh, Michael Bay movies. Why? Because by all accounts, counts he runs a ship shape operation and from beginning to end it is an absolute joy to be on set everybody's pleasant everything gets along everything shows up on time people treat it like a real job and it's just an absolute delight so what i think if i'm picking up the thread that you're dangling in front of me because i'm a kitten in this metaphor let me just add more tendrils to this uh is that there 
is, do we have a deficit of an ability to recognize that the people who bring us the things that we love as consumers, uh, the arts that, that, that we love and the stories that are told, do we fail to think of them as humans? And are we headed towards a reckoning where bad behavior, where, where this feeling that we're entitled to a story of, of a better, you know, new chapter of the Bible or whatever, uh, hmm. are, are we seeing a backlash where, uh, as fans, and I'll say we, because uh, I'm certainly guilty of it to some extent, especially since I'm going to crap all over Ant-Man and the Wasp later on. Um, uh, are, 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 is our bill about to come due for our crimes of expecting too much from the human beings who try to tell these stories in these shared universes that we love? Nicole, what do you think? That's a loaded question. I mean, uh, well, it's it's certainly I, I definitely framed it in such a way where the only answer is yes. Uh, but <laughs> but but I guess uh, to restate it, uh, I know that as a fan, I have not personally thought about the backlash and the toll and the downside yeah. of expressing my fin uh, my my feelings about this universe. As a creator, I also know um that a lot of people have a lot of opinions on how they would have done th things differently. And at some point, it's unpleasant enough to wade into certain waters that I understand exactly what uh, what the director of Logan is saying. And and it's like, no, I uh, from from a game theory, there are these what economists call externalities that make it not worth it, even though even though it might be a wonderful story, even though you might have something wonderful to contribute the safer decision is to go show up at a Michael Bay movie because ain't nobody going to uh, bash you over the head yeah. for showing up on time, looking sufficiently thin, beautiful and symmetrical uh, and, and delivering your explosion popcorn and, crap on time. And, and it's not that the Michael Bay movies won't take the heat. It's that they don't have the expectations. Correct. So people are like, oh, you right. made a stupid Michael Bay movie, not you've ruined my childhood. Yeah, I don't see anybody <laughs> reaching out to uh, Wash from Firefly for his appearances in the Transformers movies, just haranguing him constantly about how he ruined uh, uh, his own career or whatever. I don't know what what terrible things they would say. Yeah. Yes, but also I think there needs to be something said here where I think – Part of the issue with the issue with the Star Wars situation is that a lot of the anti Last Jedi comments were they weren't just oh you ruined my childhood I mean that's definitely part of it but they were also very laced with very old fashioned ways of thinking about women and race and a lot of very tied old thinking about it's it's, it's a very I don't know, entrenched way about thinking about the Star Wars universe. Now you may say, they may argue like that's that's their right to think that way, and of course they're well within their right to think whatever they want. At the same time, though, I think maybe we're giving far too much credence to that crowd. Maybe uh, story writers should be able to do their stories and create their films that they want to see and open the door to new writers and new actors from a different point of view. Um, well, okay. Well, so, so, what so Mandel is saying is uh, right now, because there are people and, and yet you're right about last Jedi, but Batman versus Superman also took loads of crap, not for the same reasons that last Jedi took loads sure. of crap. And, and, and so it's not always the same reasons. It's that, you know, people sometimes for nefarious reasons, sometimes for just, you know, personal opinions, uh, lay into folks for disappointing them. And if there's enough other folks who agree with them, then it becomes this land rush and Mangold saying, look, uh, a lot of people who you would probably want to make one of these films in this franchise won't bother because they know the risk. It's not about, Hey, you folks should calm down. It's, it's about, it's, it's a, it's a social reality out there. And, and unless that stops, it's going to dissuade people from wanting to be involved, which means you'll be left with what he, as, as he puts it, you know, uh, films to hacks and, cor and corporate boards, because those are the only people who will risk taking it. Here's an important distinction as well is uh, put on your producer hat for a moment. There are when you are in a position to spend money to have a project done, there are three categories of talent that you can hire. You can hire unproven talent. 
which, you know, mm-hmm. straight out of college, don't know nothing, uh, never done anything. You could hire proven talent, which is, uh, 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 you know, your A-list directors, your Ron Howards and so on. And you can hire uh, emerging talent. Uh, emerging talent is somebody who's maybe they've done one or two things that look pretty promising or whatever. I think that um, the the problem is when you're looking at a AAA property like Star Wars or the Mar- the MC or whatever as tempting. And of course, the sweet spot is emerging talent, really yeah. gifted people who are at a place in their lives where they're ready yeah. to try something bold and original and incredible. But yeah. a side effect of that category is that for every 10 emerging talents you buy five of them are going to miss the mark and they're going to learn a very good lesson and maybe they'll become somebody uh, uh, popular or they'll live a quiet contented life doing something else uh star wars is not is is a too big to fan too too big to fail uh franchise and it is simply not an option to gamble on on the hopes and dreams and stuff you have to buy uh proven talent and every life that is made miserable by people projecting their hate for a brief flash of self-satisfaction ends up reducing the appeal of proven talent joining the exact thing that you're trying to protect with your barbs from the internet. And I think the spirit of the tweet was just to say, just like throwing litter out the window of the car may feel good because that can is no longer in your life and you don't have to see it in your car, uh, eventually, if enough people throw their litter out the window, you got a real problem for everyone. Yeah. And the Native American guy cries. Yeah. Uh, not sure why you brought race into it. A little bit weird. <laughs> it's an old, old advertisement. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know. You I'm live in public service Brian. announcement. I'm, I'm 17 years old. You ruined my childhood, Brian. <laughs> uh, sounds to me like some Native American did. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, we ruined his day by throwing the can out of the car <laughs> but uh really what I, I i don't think we're in danger of suddenly you know no, directors boycotting star wars right but what i do think no. mangold is just trying to point out and macquarie as well is I, I don't want it to take this i don't you know like y'all like sure there's a there's a section of you out there that just rage at anything right and unreasonably so But he's hoping, I think both of them are hoping that there's a section out there who think that they're they're raging for good, that if they make all of these horrible comments, that it'll somehow, you know, turn Star Wars into the property they dreamed of. And Mangold and Macquarie are like, you're having the opposite reaction. If that's Mm. what you're thinking, you're wrong. Uh, I guess what I would say is I'm not sure that McCor how much of that audience really cares about that and how much of it is just trolling who love to like spew stuff at people. So and and that that's a separate problem in, in social networks these in, days. In classic Brian style, let me completely flip my narrative and look at it from the other side because I do think that there was a time when the suits and the boards and the arts and and the the members of the cartel of Hollywood felt like whatever we do, the fans will show up and line up and give us their money. And I do feel like they got away with with massive, massive cash grabs for what is abject artistic garbage and (laughs) I and lacking any other recourse, at least somebody could take away Twitter from them. At least they could make Twitter an unpleasant environment for them to be around. But but I definitely think we're seeing the, the pendulum hit the other side here. And and I think I if if I'm hearing you right, Nicole, it sounds like. Uh, you seem to feel like there's a middle ground we should aim for and we're just, we're seeing just uh, everything ping pong to either side. I mean, at the, on the one hand, I completely understand what he was saying. Like who, who, who wants to be the subject of, <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the internet mob hate, right? Who, who wants to be the subject of that? Um, at the same time though, don't you think Rian Johnson and the people who got involved with it probably knew what they were getting into? Well, and but- I mean, not to this extent, perhaps, right? Maybe, 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 maybe this was like way too much, way too far beyond the pale for them, which is understandable. But I think at this point, I think whoever takes it on next will probably should probably be like. Yeah, there's going to be some angry people out there. Well, no, I think that's Mangold and McCoy's point is now that we see what Ryan Johnson is having to go through and Ryan probably knew and he has proved that he's like, yeah, fine, I'll engage. Yeah. Other directors would be like, yeah, I I don't want that. I I know what I'm Mm. signing up for. And so I'm not signing up for it. 
I know what it means. And so I'm not going to direct it. I mean, I think that's the point here. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a natural response to uh, the, the the set of incentives that are currently set up for people. And I think what Mangle's trying to say is this is your environment to make or break. It's your ecosystem. It's your garden that you're building. And uh, if what you want is to attract uh, top tier talent, then maybe you should consider what kind of garden you're inviting them into. Because right now it's looking an awful lot like everyone who goes to that mar uh, garden comes out covered in thicket barbs <laughs> and scratches all over their body and doesn't seem happy that they ever went there. And and uh, I don't know. He's I, I, It's not for me to speak for him. I don't know. Yeah, but no, I, I I think maybe fewer garden analogies, but otherwise. Yeah, no, but point. let's throw a pizza analogy in there, too, right? Pizza, I like pizza. It's like pizza with cat fur, but the cat fur represents uh, Tatooine and it just keeps showing up, even though it's yeah. like, man, there hasn't been a cat around. And this what pizza Mandel for is saying, time. if you yell at the pizza delivery boy, he's just not going to bring any pizza. Yeah, anymore. well, OK, but he's contractually. Hold wow. on. Let's, who's the agent for the pizza boy in this metaphor? They're going to send a guy who's really bad at bringing pizza and your pizza is going to show up all, all mangled. <sighs> I think what Domino's anyway. I think what he's trying to say is for every nasty tweet you send to a Star Wars director, another Entourage movie is made. All right. Can we all just hold on to that? Let, I mean, is that what you want? Folks? Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Because that's just what's happening. Think, that's between, physics, think okay? before you tweet. That's all I'm right. saying. Yeah, it's just the way nature works. We, we didn't choose it. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's talk about something you can choose to support the show at patreon.com slash cord killers. Hot googly dig dog. Uh, how many years has it been at this point, Tom? Uh, six years? Is this our sixth you know, year? Uh, Bryce and I, before the show, were talking about an old segment name. And I was going back to see if I could find it. And I was shocked by how far in the dock I have to go back. It was 2014. It's this is wonderful. You guys yeah. are literal dream makers uh, because of your patronage. Uh, the following things are true. Uh, uh, Tom is able to uh, have a landing pad after he was unceremoniously uh, dumped and didn't have his contract renewed. Brian was able to quit touring on the road and spend uh, hours and hours and hours and days and, and years with my kids that I would have totally missed. Uh, and now. Uh, we're expanding. We're growing. Everything is developing because of you. Diamond Club Studios is going to be a thing today. I closed on. Um, uh, I can't wait to show it to you. It's not the most attractive property on the planet, uh, yeah. but hot damn, is there good bones? Seven acres in West Austin uh, that are going to eventually become the Modern Rogue World Headquarters, this ultimate f uh, 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 clubhouse for all of our buddies and friends, a place that you can go. Uh, I personally invite you to come out and watch the eclipse in 2024. Uh, all of this stuff, man. And this, it's the little bit. Great rivers come from small trickles and tri tributaries and every dollar you may th you may not think oh it'd be insulting to just give a dollar an episode we'd love to have it we would love to have it and it means the world and it all adds up and you guys changed our lives and uh we get to keep doubling down tom can i can i can, can we hint at what you sent me a picture of today sure sure we can we can hint uh i i'm i'm I uh, might be looking for, for new digs. Right. Brian's not the only one looking to buy. I might be inspired by somebody buying his seven green acres <laughs> in Austin. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, there might be in the Los Angeles area places with recording studios built into houses, which I might want to try to buy. Someday. Well, but it's in California. You'd have to rezone it, repermit it. There's no way that you could possibly. Some of those come with permits and everything. Oh, wow. That'd be amazing. That sounds amazing. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. There's nothing, nothing, nothing solid yet. I mean, the idea of Hold a on. West Coast I'm, Diamond Club Studios and a South Coast Diamond Club Studios. Oh, geez. I mean, possibilities. Possibilities are endless, and you make those possibilities into probabilities by backing us at patreon.com slash court killers. God, we love you. We love you so much. Thank you. Hugs. All right, let's talk about how to watch. We got a packed how to watch today uh, because new Warner Media CEO John Stanky has been stankying up the HBO <laughs> God, staff room. That's the <laughs> obvious. That's CNN talk, Tom. That's how they talk over at CNN. We're better than that. We missed All right. it. Uh, we just need five more one dollar backers, and I'll never say that yeah, again. Yeah. Stanky's feeling swanky. That's the headline on this one. Go All right, for here's, it. Here's, here's what CEO John Stanky. Uh, <laughs> oh, the has involuntary said. shutter from Bryce. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> New Warner uh, Warner Media is the name of what used to be called Time Warner that AT and T now owns. Uh, CEO John Stanky is an AT and T guy who has been put in charge of Warner Media. He had a staff meeting at HBO. New York Times got a hold of the transcript of what was said. Uh, he thinks HBO needs to broaden its focus to stay competitive. According to the New York Times, Stanky told staff that HBO needs to increase the amount of time that viewers watch HBO. Quote. We need hours a day. It's not hours a week and it's not hours a month. We need hours a day. You are competing with devices that sit in people's hands that capture their attention every 15 minutes. Stanky also said that he and HBO CEO Richard Plepler hope to produce more without sacrificing HBO standards. Stanky also said employees are going to have to work harder and compared it to having a baby. Now, this past February, HBO added the most U.S. subscribers in its history, boosting its user base by 11%. The company has about 142 million global subscribers. The steady growth of the premium cable and streaming service led to $6.3 billion in revenue last year. You need to know those numbers because they shed a little light that HBO is growing in subscribers, growing in money, and there's this exchange between Plepler and Stanky where Stanky says... Also, we've got to make money at the end of the day, right? And Plepler says, we do that to scattered applause. To which Mr. Stanky says, yes, you do. Just not enough. And Plepler says, oh, now, now be careful. So I have a feeling these two have not entirely got on the same page. And Stanky is pushing like you need growth and you need you need to you need to make more revenue. And Plepler's saying, well, hold on, we are growing and we are making revenue. You just wanted to make it grow faster, but we need to do it without compromising the prestige that HBO has. So, oh man, so much to unpack here. Uh, first of all, Sparky's an AT&T guy, is that right? Stanky. Hmm. <laughs> John, John Stanky is, but, yes, he's, yes. A, he's an AT&T AT guy. AT&T guy, all right. Uh, AT&T loves throwing their label on everything the worst decision AT&T ever made was buying singular and then rather than calling that division of wireless singular a logo that was a happy orange man that everybody loved and universally had great customer service they took a label AT&T that was associated with monopolistic garbage and decided no 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 or, or AT&T wireless everything loves AT&T uh, AT&T has a lifelong problem of trying to be all things to all people uh, Microsoft flirted with the same insanity uh, uh, and still um, uh, to its detriment. Meanwhile, HBO became ascendant and supremely powerful in the 90s by becoming known as taking big risks, catering to a very small, very specific uh, 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 type of art. And they, they created a new... Uh, category for what they do and what money and success HBO is earning right now is all on the backs of these very specific, very targeted, insane gambles that they are taking on shows like Westworld, Game of Thrones. Uh, and even I was joking about Entourage, but when Entourage came out, that was a gamble. The Wire was a gamble. Uh, the idea that HBO should be the everything network may be the single worst idea I've heard in the entire lifetime of this program, and it would not surprise me at all if it was an AT&T guy, uh, Professor Sparkles, who brought it up. Uh, to be fair, AT&T doing quite well. Uh, AT&T acquired DirecTV and did not change DirecTV into AT&T TV or anything like that. So there, there, there are some exceptions uh, to, to AT&T's decisions. But I, I, I agree that poetically speaking, this does fit into the sort of idea of, of homogenization. Now, they're not changing the name of HBO to AT&T, for goodness sake. But <laughs> what they're doing is looking at Netflix and saying, hey, uh, you know how you spent $2 billion on programming HBO? Well, they spent $12 billion, and they're becoming one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, what we want to do, and this is in the transcript, 
is sell people advertising based on the data we have on them. The more data we have on them, the more money we can make. So you need more users. AT&T is basically saying, we don't care how you get it. You just need more people because then we have more data, which means more advertisement sales, which means more money. It doesn't even have to be advertisements on HBO. They're not going to change HBO into ad supported. That's not what I'm saying. They're saying when we have the collected data from HBO, we can then call, collate those customers into other places and sell data. That's oh. what Google but, does. That's but, what Facebook the way, does. And it's not with advertising, but it is what Netflix does as far as using its customer data to improve its service. Yeah. Then uh, uh, before I hand everything over to, uh, to Nicole, I mean, people do not realize just how valuable that data is. If they if HBO knows for a fact that you're a male 27 years old in this particular region in the United States and that you uh, have rewatched Game of Thrones three times, that is money in the bank when it comes time to uh, sell ads over on a, a, a Pinterest for knitted hats in the shape of a dragon totally. eating uh, <laughs> a, 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 a Daenerys or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's where this game is going. So that's, to me, the disconnect. Plepler's like, hey, we're, we're growing our business by making really good shows, and we've survived the onslaught because we've been adaptable and made HBO now. Uh, <laughs> what's your problem? And John Stanky is saying, uh, great, we just want more. We want you to double that. No, it's going to be really hard work, but, you know, go for it. Nicole, what do you make of this mess? How much money are they throwing at HBO to do all this? Will they get the same budget as Netflix? Are they are they are they within the same realm? Are they saying, hey, HBO, we want not one Game of Thrones, but fifty of them. We want twelve. You know, I mean, yes, they are willing and... to spend more money. That's 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 not a problem. Right. As but... long as it gets them the the increased users, yeah. Well, the, the, the problem, I think, is that Netflix, I mean, bless Netflix is hard. I mean, it has a lot of good program, but it has a lot, has a lot of trash on it as well. Like Netflix well, is. And a, yet, yet somehow, Nicole, Netflix has done the impossible of being the best source for hot garbage and also the best source for Emmy award winning dramas and comedies and everything. Uh, and yet, and yet, um, uh, maintain the superposition of, of, of people liking them for both. That is an extraordinary, uh, that's an outlier. That's, that's, that's wild. I, I don't believe that HBO has it in them to try to play that same game to be everything. And yet the one thing at the same time, Netflix is McDonald's and HBO is like, you know, the classy restaurant down the street. Like you don't want the restaurant to be selling McDonald's. Yep, yep, yep. I agree. Yeah. And and what John Stanky is saying is like, look, TGI Fridays, we just want as many people as McDonald's gets. But you don't have to become fast food. <sighs> I mean, that's why you don't go to McDonald's. It's and like, then HBO you know, is like, we are so not TGI Fridays. I mean, you like, do like, not get us at all. I mean, that's stars. Uh, 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 Netflix's new slogan, like like uh, uh, HBO. Uh, uh, HBO's new slogan is like, uh, uh, we're like Netflix. Uh, we'll take you. Uh, I guess you know. <laughs> sure. What else? What else you got? Here, here's what I think, uh, and and. This is this is a dangerous mismatch of cultures, and it sounds like Plepler is doing his best to navigate it. Uh, but if what AT&T really wants is users, cut the price. Take the hit, cut the price. You will get more users. There are plenty of people out there who are like, yeah, if it's $5 cheaper, I'd totally get HBO. Then double the budget, but only require not double the shows, but less than double the shows so that you have even higher quality shows. Uh, get get more higher quality shows and cut the price and you will you will have an increase because if what you want is that data to sell in other channels, you can afford that's your spend, right? It's not about fill up HBO with a bunch of crap so that people watch it on their phone. I mean, there might be some things they could do as far as like, oh, making more highlights, making more mobile friendly content uh, that's not necessarily adding new stuff but repackaging game of thrones look at all those youtube channels like secrets of the citadel that do a great job on theories what if you mimicked that from inside the house right with actually george r martin telling you about the theories or something like that there are ideas to, to do there and those would be good as well because they're only adding to stuff they're not taking away from it any uh anything else about hbo nicole before we move on to netflix oh yes let's talk about netflix mcdonald's i don't mcdonald's 
Yeah, uh, so we're we're leaving uh, BJ's and we're heading down to McDonald's. Uh, some European users have noticed an ultra tier show up in their Netflix plans. Now the plans sometimes show up with prices of sixteen ninety nine euros, sometimes with nineteen ninety nine euros, sometimes in between. The current top tier of Netflix in Europe is Netflix Premium at thirteen ninety nine. So all of these are more expensive. And sometimes the higher price has the same exact options as premium, more of a like, would you just like to pay more? Other times premium becomes only two simultaneous streams with no HDR. Right now you get four simultaneous streams with HDR. Uh, and Netflix told CNET it is testing different price points and features to see what customers value. Also, Netflix notified users it's removing its user reviews from the service. Netflix says usage of the written reviews has been declining, uh, and so they just don't feel like it's worth maintaining. CNET reports Netflix is going to stop accepting new reviews on July 30th and remove them altogether sometime in mid-August. And finally, a survey last week from Wall Street firm Cohen & Company found that of 2,500 U.S. adults surveyed, 27%, so not quite a third of the respondents, used Netflix most often to watch video, trailed by basic cable at 20%, broadcast TV at 18%, and YouTube at 11%. Netflix had an even bigger lead among adults 18 to 35, dominating their viewing habits with 40% of the respondents in that age group. So to recap, Netflix teasing, uh, testing a price increase, uh, Netflix removing user reviews that it, you probably all forgot they even had, and it looks like Netflix is more popular than cable TV right now. The removal of the reviews is a testament. I I think this is the important part. When we talk about the reason that they're saying we need more people watching HBO so we could get more data about the individual people to sell stuff to, like understand just how rich this data set is. It knows what parts of every single show you back up and watch a second time. This will shape programming in the future. And in fact, they figured out what this is an indication, I think for years they've known that what people say is not consistent with what they actually do. And finally, you know, we've, we've seen shows like um, uh, We Have Concerns used to always say like, uh, hey, give us a rating, but don't leave a review. Nobody reads those because we've all figured out where reviews are a bunch of garbage, uh, a bunch of block text of nonsense. And uh, meanwhile, what matters is the data, the how did you behave when you watch this thing? And I do understand the impulse for an AT&T guy to say, well, we have an insufficient data set because we don't have enough volume to get a proper sample size and we need more more stuff but i do think it would be a compromise to try to make uh hbo the solution to all people in the meantime but 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 this i don't know this this makes me feel like like i want to know what insights are in this data that are so precious that they're just breaking the entire uh, structure of what brought them to the place that they are right now nicole there is a reason why, I mean, this is my thinking of why they got rid of the user reviews. I mean, they say it was because of lack of usage, which it definitely probably is the case, but there are a couple of reasons for that, I think. Number one is that they downgraded from star ratings to just thumbs up, thumbs down, remember? And they also moved from not having your byline attached to your review at all. So that would probably dis disincentivize most people from leaving reviews in the first place. And second of all, have you seen some of those reviews? Um, <laughs> especially the reviews for um, The Last Jedi have been just, just awful, just all around terrible. A lot of like review bombing is happening with a lot of these movies to, 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 to drop the ratings. Also, Netflix is really relying on their algorithms, like their their recommendation algorithm. So you know the the top picks, the top picks for whoever on your Netflix list, like that's what they're looking for. Like that's what they're going for as as like the the benchmark in terms of what they think you want, the, the thumbs up stuff, right? And they're relying on that algorithm. I mean, I mean, all these companies are relying on their algorithms now to to figure out what to recommend to you, and um, that's I think part of the reason. Plus. User reviews are kind of like the you know comment section of the web. Like some of them are, are just are awful, just awful. So one positive note, and, and I don't think we really had it out, and I don't even know if I know Tom's opinions on this, but I think that there's a lot of credibility to the idea of removing starred reviews because uh, how you encourage people to rate stuff 
the format of it in some way shapes the way people rate it, right? Where it's like if you made it a letter grade, everything would be a, either a B plus or a B minus or whatever. Or if, if, if like, a, okay, you can leave a review, but you have to look at a picture of the director and his family while you do it. Like, I mean, this <laughs> this kind of thing matters, right? Um, and I think the just the binary uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, and for those who do not know, uh, uh, there may be a, a torrid, affectionate affair between Tom and somebody over at Rotten Tomatoes, uh, but uh, uh, Rotten Tomatoes does essentially that because a review is either positive or negative and it takes the aggregate and of that figures out like, is this generally a well-accepted and loved uh, movie or not? Yeah, we've been talking quite a bit on Daily Tech News Show about the five-star reviews relating to the kiosks in uh, restaurants. If you go to places like Chili's, there'll be a kiosk where you can order your drinks and stuff so you, you don't have to wait for the, the server to come around. And they all have surveys at the end and the wait staff pretty much have to instruct people, leave me five stars, because if you don't leave me five stars, I'm going to get fewer shifts because it's, it, that's just how it works. Because the psychology is if you're not getting five stars, you're failing. Uh, so yeah, star, star reviews, ratings, it goes way, you know, there's, there's all kinds of research about this. They just don't, they're just not very, uh, I mean, a truly, not very helpful. a truly better system would be some kind of aggregate where you never got the same version twice. Maybe one time it says on a scale of one to 73, you know, one to randomly select a number, you know, how, how great were they? And then another one, like, uh, look at these five emojis, which one describe looks the most like you're feeling. And then the other one is just like, name your least favorite, uh, Panamanian province. Okay, great. Now tell me uh, how many stars you give it. You know, it's, 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 it's uh, we live in an age where we can constantly randomize all these things and i think we would get a little bit more accurate non-biased results as a result all right let's talk about what to watch next in under surveillance like and you can rate it after all about location, location, location. Under surveillance. at anime expo netflix announced loads of shows uh renewal of agritsuko for 2019 uh, Castlevania Season 2 coming October 26th. Netflix also announced a sequel to Monster Planet, Godzilla, City on the Edge of Battle, coming July 18th. And the series Dragon Pilot coming September 21st. Also in 2019, the debut of Ultraman from production IG. Kengen Ashura, a middle-aged salaryman conscripted to fight deadly brawls for his company. Uh, and Cannon Busters, a group of quirky robots forced to work together to find a missing pr princess. If you didn't catch it, those are three different shows. Ultraman, Kengan Ashura uh, is p production IG, uh, and uh, uh, Cannon Busters. Those, those are the three shows. So Bryce had brought up uh, uh, Agretsuka, is that what it is? Agretsuko. Agretsuko, uh, uh, yeah. Suko. Uh, 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 a Agretsuko. while ago. Um, did you ever finish the first season? Oh, yeah. It was, it was very short. It was like... 10, 10 minute episodes. I had the pleasure of introducing it to my family and oh, yeah. of my three daughters. Can you guess which one fell deeply in love instantly? Uh, probably Josie. That's exactly right. Yeah. Also, uh, during that time that you introduced it, we had the discussion of the curious effect of like in America, it's called Pokemon. In Japan, it's called uh, Pocket Monsters. And we had suggested the fact that maybe they wanted it to sound American in Japan and to sound Japanese in America. Mm. Um, uh, only after I was watching along and reading synopses of Josie watching it did I realize that uh, Retsuko is the name of the character. So Ag added to the beginning for aggressive Agretsuko. Retsuko. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, that made more sense as a, as a pun play. I don't know if you brought that up at the time, but I finally caught yeah. that. Cool. Yeah. I'm glad to see it's coming back because it kind of ends on a pretty definitive note. Oh. But uh, uh, Does she die? Do, no, do I, do she I doesn't gotta... die. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> No, but uh, I'm glad to see more of it. But they uh, made a ton of web series, too, so I'm glad. Speaking of which, there was this great moment. Uh, forgive me for the uh, side jag here, but it's on topic. Um, I want to say Common Sense Media is is the site. Uh, there was this brief flash when I tried to find it for my youngest daughter, and I could, it wouldn't come up in the YouTube, in the Netflix Kids. And mm -hmm. I thought, maybe there's a reason for that. Like, whoopsie, did I take an adult story and put it in my 10-year-old's hands? And uh, looking it up, uh, I want to say, I think it was Common Sense Media Reviews had a fairly, fairly simple way of breaking it down. Like, here's how much use of alcohol. It's two out of five stars, uh, stars uh, or dots. Uh, here's how much poor language you have to worry about. Here's how much sexual content. Here's so much, wh whatever. Uh, as a parent, I really 
adored being able to get a quick snap shot and instantly know that I don't have to, to to fear it. And they also break it out and they say, here are reviews from adults about this kid's programming. Mm-hmm. Here are reviews from kids about this kid's programming. And uh, uh, it made me feel totally fine about my 10 year old watching it. Yeah, I think I ended up on that review at some point when I was looking for more information about it. And it really puts into perspective how how culturally appropriate it is mm. in that like it features a lot of drinking because getting drinks after work is a very big thing and the whole show is based around her yelling at her boss and so it's it's it it is maybe a little more mature than the sanrio aesthetic might initially mm-hmm. let on to but i think it's also still kid appropriate Netflix also ordered 10 episodes of Mixtape, a romantic musical series that Fox piloted but did not greenlight. So Fox ordered a pilot. They said, no, we don't want the series. So Netflix is going to do it with a different main actor. Uh, The show intertwines love stories from a disparate group of people living in Los Angeles who all apparently sing. And then they sing about their intertwining love. Nice. I guess. All right. Let's talk about what we're watching. Start with you, Nicole. All right. Uh, This is like a collection of stuff I've been watching for the past few weeks, so I apologize if it's lengthy. Um, I've been catching up on a lot of Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff just because I haven't been watching it for the past few years, <laughs> and I think I'm, I'm woefully behind. And the reason why I said it because I, w- I wanted to watch the latest, uh, you know, the latest movie in in the theaters. But like, I have all of these movies that I haven't watched yet. I was like, well, I have to watch them all. And thankfully, they're all on Amazon and Netflix. So I was like, all right. <laughs> and so I watched. Yes, what did I watch yesterday? I watched um, the, the the first Ant Man yesterday, which I think will set up Brian for your Ant Man the Wasp sequel later. Mm-hmm. I watched the first Ant Man yesterday, and I watched uh, Civil War yesterday as well. So I'm trying to. <laughs> oh, so you've not you've not yet caught up to the the glory and the shining uh, beacon on the hill that is Thor Ragnarok. Right. Uh, I'm, oh my God, I'm waiting in anticipation for that because Thor. I think Thor is my favorite out of all of them. Anyway, um, I am just like, you know, I'm just going through the list, just going through the motions and just watching, watching them all to like check them on the list. And um, I actually enjoyed the original Ant-Man, actually. I mean, I liked it for what it was, um, but, you know, we'll see what the sequel is like. And then um, I've been watching, of course, the World Cup on YouTube TV, actually, which I think does a pretty good job of it. And uh, although my friends who have been watching it on Fubo TV tell me that it's pretty good on that service as well. I've been watching it on PlayStation View and it's been fine there. So, yeah, it's oh, it's good. kind of got to the point where yeah, just whatever service you have whatever probably works. You have. I know. It's amazing. And uh, I have to shout out for Queer Eye. I don't know if you guys have talked about it yet, but it yeah. is by far my favorite show on Netflix just because it is so uplifting and it makes me cry every episode. It is it's it's happy tears just I don't know this just it's a very cleansing show to watch it's just it's respectfully so positive it's amazing it's so positive and I mean especially in today's you know political climate like it's so good to watch something that's positive and like uplifting and very good to watch I highly recommend it anyone who watched Kurai um and uh, also um, foreign movies. So I've been sort of learning Mandarin Chinese as, mm. as a little side thing I'm doing. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to like watch more Chinese movies, but it's really hard to get those on most streaming mm-hmm. services. So I've been kind of like watching like uh, bootleg copies of it online, and it's not the best experience by far. And I'm trying to find more options of like ways to watch foreign movies especially of course in me for me i'm looking looking for like chinese movies yeah if well, sling has, sling there, any has a, a bunch of uh, chinese language television sh- channel options on sling tv and uh playstation view has a channel called haya which shows uh chinese series tv series a lot, a lot of them are martial arts based series hence the name of the channel but not all of them are that's good to know. Like, I'm trying to like find like a list of like good places to watch Chinese like content, just so I can like brush up on my yeah, skills yeah. a little bit more. And well, last but not least, kind of like a throwaway piece here, IGTV, which is Instagram TV, and I kind of laughed about it. I kind of, I totally laughed it off. I'm like, Who, who's gonna watch TV on their Instagram, right? Except the other day, I found myself just watching like Mr. Bean clips ha! on Instagram. <laughs> on IGTV because there's a, there's a Mr. Bean Instagram account and there's just like there's just like little clips of Mr. Bean sketches 
on Instagram. And it's like, it's so silly. And I, kind of dumb. I will confess that I have had my own version of that where I <laughs> fell down into, at some point, you just turn on autoplay on YouTube and you let it go from individual Mr. Show sketch to individual Mr. Show sketch. <laughs> and you don't care because it's Mr. Show and you like all of Mr. Show. Yeah, it's just, it's dumb, but I like it. And it's, I mean, it's, I guess it's TV, quote unquote, on your phone. I don't know. Man, all I, I know was, is that it's on while I'm working on the Cord Killers doc. And that's, that's all it <laughs> needs to be. All right, Brian, what about you? Uh, man, I watched, uh, I made the kids watch The Karate Kid, which meant I rewatched The Karate Kid. The movie, not. Yeah. Not uh, Cobra Kai. Not an actual kid who is doing karate, yes. No, no, but I mean, not the YouTube series. You watched the original movie that it is the series came from. That is correct. Uh, mainly yeah. because I wanted to see uh, how my kids responded to Cobra Kai, and they, of course, I think it would do better for them to experience that. Um, man, definitely uh, just, you know, cry my eyes out, seeing Pat Morita be just amazing and Pat Morita as hell. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, I can't tell if I'm weeping for my own childhood or for the loss of a talented actor, but, uh, but, uh, uh, it, 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 it showed its wrinkles and its age here and there, but on balance, the kids were sucked all the way in. And then, uh, and my favorite thing was when you get to the end and it's playing, you're the best around. I'm like, and now you know what they're referencing on regular show. And then I play that <laughs> clip or whatever. Uh, it was great. It was, it was wonderful. Also, uh, watching a preacher continues to be a breath of fresh air in my life after the tedious soul sucking void that Westworld has been. There's something just delightful about the nihilistic joyride every single episode on that show. We'll talk more about that in spoiler in time. And I saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, it wasn't what I was hoped. More on why Brian was disappointed <laughs> in spoiler in time. Uh, I, I have watched Deadwood and Preacher as well. We'll talk about those in spoiler in time. And Eileen and I binged Jessica Jones and Luke Cage uh, over the July 4th holiday and into the weekend. Jessica Jones, I like Jessica Jones, and that's all. The story is just bad. Does it, uh, it, uh, see, this is season two or season? This is season two, the most recent okay. season. And it's it's not only just bad, like the, the villain, you never really, you're like waiting for the villain, the real villain to show up. And then you're like, oh, I guess it's episode 12 and that's the real villain. Uh, so it's a great one to have on in the background. Uh, I was able to do other things while watching it. Luke Cage was a much better story, but there was just something about it that never quite clicked with me. I feel like they, they built some really great characters this season, again, season two of Luke Cage, but they just never executed a thing that made me feel like it was worth all the buildup. Uh, kind of fizzled out towards the end, but definitely better than Jessica Jones. Right on. All right, Bryce, what should we be on the lookout for? Hey, everybody. I wanted to let everyone know that uh, Glow on Netflix had its second season come out. And it's great. I'm almost done watching it. Uh, if you don't know, Glow is the, the fictionalized retelling of the story of the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, a uh, local cable all-women's wrestling show. Uh, season two picks up right after their big successful show at the end of season one uh, as they train and, and learn wrestling and they fight out creative differences as they've gotten a TV show deal. And uh, they they give a good look at where Glow lands between being uh, exploitative of these women and the stereotypes that they use and being empowering, uh, which I think is, is a good turn. Uh, I nearly finished the season, and the the high point for me so far has been uh, episode eight, which is a a played very straight entire episode of Glow. It's got the skits and the wrestling. They play they do two different like music videos in the middle of it, and it's the whole episode. And it's really it's it's there's a lot of confidence to say, okay, the schlocky '80s wrestling show that we're doing. We're gonna make a real one of it, and it's gonna be this entire episode. It's really good. That's great. That's uh, that's a little bit like when you go to some kind of theater experience, and they break the fourth wall, or somebody walks into the audience, or 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 you know involves you in the show. Yeah. That break of format, uh, I bet, was a refreshing twist. Yeah, because you, you start with it, and you start in the middle of a skit, and you're like, okay, they're kind of explaining how this one thing is gonna be, and resolved. then it just keeps going, but it keeps going, <laughs> and then there's a music video, and the music's good, and then there's, it's great. It's it's really good. I have to. I have to say I have to say, like, I haven't watched mm. the new season yet, but I watched the first season. And this is probably my favorite. This is probably the show where Mark Maron arrives. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, yeah. I, honestly, I honestly believe this is the show where he's truly 
arrived as an actor, as mm-hmm. as a as a like a performer. Like I have, yeah. I don't know. I, I I think he's really good at it. The the only well. kind of bummer, and I think this affects Mark too, is that it has such a large cast, and not everyone gets the space to develop their character. Like season two has a lot of really good character focused episodes. Like, uh, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Tim A, the, who plays the welfare queen, like she's she's a hardworking woman. She's had a lot of jobs. She's she knows the value of of putting in her work, but she has this really awkward experience with her son taking her son to college, and finding out that her that his mom is playing the welfare queen on television. And and it's it, there there are really great moments like that. But I also kind of want more of that because there are good characters and there are good messages that they can expound on you know um so that's that that's that um but i i my recommendation is if uh you're looking to go into season two to rewatch the end of season one because there's definitely some stuff that i was like who is this why is this happening um uh but check out season two of glow now streaming on netflix got something we should be on the lookout for you got to email us cordkillers at gmail.com now brian yes. what are you gonna do with all that land uh, man, that's up for the fans to decide. If only there was a way for me to connect with the fans uh, directly where I could tell mm-hmm. them exactly what's going on in a platform that wasn't tied to something like YouTube or Twitter. Oh, wait, it's the email list. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, Brian, I remember you. Yeah, I've got an email from you. Um, I'm already on your email list. No, that's not what I'm asking. I have one thing for you. We are about to enter a very critical couple of months of figuring out what we're going to do with this property, how we're going to build stuff out, and what extent you you would like to participate and by participate i mean all the way down to you hopping on a freaking plane and showing up and helping me hang a picture on the wall go into your email right now if you've ever gotten an email from me go into your email just type in brian brushwood look for everything in spam or whatever add me to your contacts take one brief moment to make sure that all the number one find out how many times i've sent something to you and you never saw it that's enlightening number two uh do something about it Thank you. That's my pitch. Okay. You can uh, go to scamstuff.com to sign up to be on that. Oh, yeah. If, yeah, if, if you, you haven't already no, no, signed no. up, just go to scamstuff.com. And then uh, there's a, a, it quite literally says, sign up to have Brian personally spam your face with awesome. Mm-hmm. So just punch, punch in your email and add me to your contacts so you actually see it when it comes out. All right. Let's move on to the front lines. Front lines. TiVo CEO Enrique Rodriguez is leaving the company for a role at Liberty Global, where he will become its CTO. Rodriguez just joined TiVo in November of 2017. Uh, Raghu Rao, who is on TiVo's board, has been named the interim president and CEO of the company, and Rodriguez will keep an advisory role. I don't really know what this means, but it's not good. Um, For whom? For TiVo. Uh, well, it sounds like, uh, yeah, no, you're right. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, human error. It's hilarious. Uh, Sony posted the entire directed DVD movie or, uh, directed digital video movie, Kali the killer to its YouTube channel nine months after it hit retail. Funny thing is the title of the video was official red band trailer. So maybe it's a marketing stunt to get more people to watch. Red no. band trailers. You mean they think more people are going to know about Kali the Killer now that they've made this horrible mistake than would have known before? Actually, I was not pitching for a conspiracy theory, but the more I'm talking it out, the more it sounds like a brilliant idea. Hmm. Hey, an Amazon job posting in the UK is seeking a head of free-to-air TV and advertising. At least it was until people noticed it when Amazon changed it to head of prime video channels, free-to-air ad TV and advertising TV partner channels, and then realized that didn't make any sense and changed it to head of prime video partner channels. The description said this individual will be responsible for widening the content range with the development of free and advertising funded channels and act as an internal champion for free to air and advertising funded content. Now, some expect this relates to Premier League soccer running on prime next year for free with traditional commercials running during the matches. But speaking of conspiracy theories, everybody's got one about this, too. Nicole, did that make sense to you? Did you understand all those words? (laughs) Because they did not to me. And I'm wondering if there's like... (laughs) Can you, if I were to restate what I just heard, I think what they were saying is like, is there somebody who understands advertising? Because we don't do advertising very often. Here, let, me, let me try to explain this again to you. Amazon posted a job posting that used head of free to air TV, which made everyone think oh, Amazon's <gasps> going to start a broadcast television channel. And then Amazon changed the job post twice to have it say 
head of prime video partner channels, which reasonable people said, oh, they just want someone to work with other channels to come onto the Amazon Prime Video platform like they do with HBO and Stars, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe it was the kind of thing that the original description for the job was colored by, you know what, you know who we need is somebody who's an expert in this kind of thing, even though we Use don't offer keywords. that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Totally. Let's let's attract people from this business. Now that makes sense. Uh, movie Pass surge pricing has gone into effect, and they said movies that are high in demand for title, date, or time of day will be impacted. Movies in the app will display a red lightning icon when they're in peak pricing and a gray icon when they're in approaching peak pricing status. The amounts and conditions of the increase are not noted. One example showed Avengers Infinity War costing $4.43 extra to see at 7 p.m. Subscribers can waive uh, one peak pricing fee per month. I think they should double down on the gamification and actually make a little video game that you have to, and if you make it, you get to waive this one what? and make it easy enough that anyone can do it. But, but well, like, why do like, they, like, what do they get out of that? Um, uh, uh, engagement. It's called engagement. They can run ads. But they need information, not engagement. You know what they need is literally any way to make money. Their business model is insane and they're Blockchain. crashing. <laughs> Blockchain, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, finally, sources told Windows Central that Microsoft's working on a movies and TV app for iOS and Android. Uh, Microsoft's been doing this with Edge, Launcher, uh, taking a lot of their software that used to be Windows only, making it available for iOS and Android. So now if you buy TV or movies on your Xbox and this happens, you'll be able to watch them on your Android tablet. Hooray, Microsoft. All right, let's move on to some dispatches, which I hear are from the front. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, killers. Why are these dispatches always fronting? Yeah. Don't be fronting. Keith wrote in and said, we paid $160 a month for cable and a sports package through Spectrum. We cut the cord and now we only spend $60 a month for our services, Sling, Hulu, and Philo. We don't count Netflix or Amazon in the calculations because we already had those services before. We also got a Tableau 4 tuner over the air device, multiple Rokus. So we had to wait 10 months or so to effectively see these savings, but we are now operating on a savings of $100 a month. Truthfully, cable is easier. With the streaming services, we have to think about which service has the channel we want to watch. Is anyone else in the house watching? Buffering issues with one service, so switch over to another, et cetera, et cetera. With cable, you just turn on and go to the channel you want. I look forward to the day, though, that one service will give me a list of every channel that exists and allows me to check the box for each channel I want and then quote me a price. I pay and bleep, blop, bloop. I've got one service to rule them all. Sound familiar, Brian? I think he will eventually have an evolved sense as I do in that I don't, I no longer want that because that sounds to me like a decision that I have to make. And I very much enjoy not having to make decisions. But <laughs> Ian from Canada writes in saying, Hey guys, some good news for Canadian cord cutters. I got a call from my ISP. Tell us who uh, with, with a new streaming offer, it's called PIK, PIK TV. It has live video like cable, but streamed on your phone, tablet, or computer with an option to buy an Android box if need be. It's 10 bucks a month with up to 23 regional channels, five extras to add on, and a few premium channels that are like add-on subscriptions. Look like Looks like we are finally getting some services uh, like you guys uh, 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 in the south of us. Uh, yeah. it, this sounds like what you were just hoping for, right? Uh, yeah, congratulations, Canada. We are your pants. Yep. <laughs> Alan wrote in and said, Hi, Brian and Tom. As I was listening to Brian's description of his ideal pop culture Sherpa experience, my only thought was, this sounds exhausting. I definitely don't want this. Uh, this was the idea that, you know, you'd have uh, a service that would tell you, like, watch this documentary, then watch this clip, and then you'll be ready to watch this movie, and then watch this series. Uh, Alan wants none of that. He says, I agree that this is not what services like DC Universe are up to. I think instead, they see successful services like Amazon Prime that bundle a bunch of separate media subscription services together. Amazon probably finds that it's easy to offer more services that seem to provide more value, even though most customers don't actually use all the services on offer. It might be that Tom and I have a bias because we're the kind of people who love seven, uh, uh, 500 page book long epic journeys and then arguing about which book to read in which order to get what experience and so on. But I, I know for a fact, I witnessed real magic performed for me. Yeah. Neil Stevenson, very good example, right? Or the shared universe of Stephen King and so on. Um, I know that it was positively magical that there was a time after a long day of shooting the modern rogue Brant sat down at my computer and said, hey, you know, giant bomb, 
And I'm like, yeah. You're like, sometimes they open mail. Watch this. And I watched seven minutes of him opening some mail from a fan. I'm like, the hell's going on? And he's like, hey, now watch this. And he plays a news report of some person who is a killer and uh, and whatever. I'm like, okay, uh, what, where, where, where's this going? And he's just like, that person was a fan of Giant Bomb. And that's the person that sent in that stuff. Me thinking it's the end of the story. Oh, cool. And he goes, all right, now let me show you. There's a BBC documentary about the killer. And they got a hold of some of that footage I showed you before. Let me show you what they did with it. And it was so funny the way they used every cheap trope from every news reporting make things look dastardly slow motion as people are are cocking an airsoft gun and all that stuff it was an absolute joy and i realized that i was witnessing a pop culture dj uh freestyle for me and it was pure art and wonderful and i would like to see more of that to to know that there's another job in between the artist on top of the mountain and us down on in the valley uh, uh whose job it is uh, the sherpa it's a fine metaphor i'm glad i thought of it uh and uh, uh, to to take us uh for the best experience apparently i'm alone in this well, apparently i'm alone with... on the air yeah yeah apparently i don't know uh all right let's finish up with sean who says hey employees and guest host I don't know what you're talking about regarding the last Indiana Jones movie. I can still remember when I saw it in the theater and will remember the experience till the day I die. It might be because of the in-theater experience that I had. I saw it at the now-closed Ziegfeld Theater in Midtown Manhattan, a great old movie palace. Plus, there was this guy that had a striking resemblance to Paul McCartney sitting in my row. Then the movie ended, and this guy spoke to his wife, and he even had an English accent. Huh, this guy could be a shorter Paul McCartney, I thought. Then literally everyone else gawked at him once out in the lobby because it was actually Paul McCartney. I watched a random movie with a freaking beetle. I've never gone back to watch it, but I do have a foggy recollection that there was a flying refrigerator that Indiana Jones was inside for some reason, but that couldn't have been because that doesn't make a lick of sense. Keep up the good work. Your boss, Sean. Yeah. Hey, man, if you guys want to write in with your adventures, hit us up at cordkillers at gmail.com. Excellent. Nicole Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Where can folks find you online? Twitter.com slash Nicole. Do it. Go your- follow. <laughs> it's the first person I followed on Twitter. It should be the person you follow next. That's right. <laughs> Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. And we're live on twitch.tv slash night attack, which is also carried on diamondclub.tv. Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We will join you next time. Hey, guys. Brian and Tom here. And it's just the same old message at the end of the credits, just like always. That's right, Brian. Nothing new here except your name showing up. Oh my gosh! Because I've you got a just name. supported us on Patreon. Yeah, all those five dollar donors. Look at that. That's your name in pixels. We're gonna make you famous, kid. Put your There's name in pixels on the internet. There's some classic names in there, but some of you are new. Some of you aren't there. It's sad. What can they do, Brian? I mean, they could go to Patreon.com/slash Cord Killers and pledge five dollars an episode to be one of these amazing people, like this be one. Amazing. Oh, look at look at that name right there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>